seen almost a 75 basis point move in in treasuries um, or thereabouts over you know the span of a year, year and a half or so. We've um, uh, we haven't seen quite that same uh, corresponding rise in, in in debt rates, primarily because the stre- spreads have shrunk. Um, so yes, we're definitely seeing that, and that's one of the reasons why we favor fixed rate financing when we can get it. Uh, because that effectively provides us a, an arbitrage, especially if we can get truly long dated uh, financing terms like we can with our 221D4 program. Todd, this is and, Mark. And Mark. Yep. Oh, um, good. I, okay. I uh, had some technical issues here, so I guess you started the QA. I have. So I tackled the first question with regards to um, debt finding terms and uh, debt financing terms and, and how they've risen somewhat in the last uh, several months. Very good. All right, I had a couple other questions. You mentioned the uh, the entitlement risk, I mean, the entitlement process, you do a lot of work on yeah. that. What are the entitlement risks for the fund and, and exactly how does that work as far as buying the assets before you do the entitlements or is it uh, value add as a part of the entitlements? Exactly how does that work? Yeah, so I mean, typically, as I mentioned, you know, we're generally not underwriting entitlements um, as a value. Um, and but we are underwriting the cost the costs associated with that as part of our value add acquisition. So typically we're acquiring a, a an office building um, where really our underwritten business thesis is just uh, the value add execution on that office building. And in that particular example, we would expect to generate a mid teens type IRR over a five year window um, uh, as a hold on that that office investment and uh, that would typically result in a 175 to maybe a 2x multiple uh, net to investors on just the, you know that property if you think about how that kind of works generally if we're able to get the entitlements that's sort of icing on the cake and so um, that can add you know anywhere from a 0.5x multiple to maybe a 1x multiple in the case of Park Charlotte you can see it actually added almost a not quite but almost a 2x multiple so it's a, a nice way of adding value for, you know, in most markets that we work in, that's less than a $250,000 in investment. Um, and uh, and then um, and then finally, if we're actually able to execute on the vertical development, that can add another 0.5 to 1x multiple um, and allowing us to really get into, you know, a much higher return without taking a lot of that incremental risk from the start. And you mentioned the subsidies, I guess, tax credits, et cetera. Is there a way to quantify that? Is that an extra half percent, one percent, two percent boost to returns? What, how big a number is the uh, potential subsidies? Well, you know, it, it all it all depends on the self-driven uh, subsidies, um, where, you know, which is the, the shared parking and and sometimes the sort of the freelance through, through entitlements. A lot of that helps us really get to our effective. Um, you know, renter pool base, which is much larger and uh, allows us to compete more effectively. Uh, so some of that's absorbed in that. The, the subsidy components, however, um, you know, can be quantified um, pretty readily. In our first three projects, for example, you know, our subsidies are generating anywhere from, call it, you know, effectively, you know, $3.5 million of net present value or cap value on up to almost $8 million. Um, and that equates to a monthly rent advantage over our competitors of anywhere from, you know, $75 a unit a month all the way up to, you know, close to $200 a unit a month, um, if, if that sort of helps. And, and so on a percentage basis, it's kind of hard to quantify that, but it could add anywhere from, you know, call it, you know, ha- half a percentage point to maybe a couple to two, two to three percentage points of return. All right. And the uh, you may have already covered this, but the, the cap rates, what's the trend you're seeing in the last few months? It's you know, at three three percent on the ten year treasury today. And what's what's the market reacting to that? And how should that affect yeah. the fund? Yeah, we've definitely seen some rise in cap rates, but demand for commercial real estate has been remained pretty strong. So we've not seen a substantial move up. It's certainly not a corresponding move. Um, to give you an idea on how we underwrite our um, our acquisitions or, or development, we benchmark off the 10-year treasury and have a set 
spread that we use. And then what we do is we actually assume that cap rates will continue to migrate upward. So we assume a uh, migration trend, and we base that migration rate on the um, uh, on the um, the type of loan we're able to secure. So to the extent we're using shorter term debt, um, that's variable rate, um, so bridge debt. Um, we will migrate that cap rate exit at a more aggressive, I mean, at a, a more conservative rate, so much larger bumps on an annual basis. On the other hand, if we're able to secure loans like that 221D4 loan I mentioned earlier, we will, we'll, you know, we're willing to migrate at a much lower incremental step because effectively that's a, a loan product that um, uh, is really a hedge on it, on that inflation. All right. And the long-term Long-term trends on office have not been positive. So, what what mitigates that risk uh, for your fund? Is it the, the markets you're in, or what what's your take on the the low occupancy of of, of office as an asset class versus other asset classes? Yeah. So, um, so office we tend to view office investing a little bit different than we do multifamily investing, and so with office we tend to view that as a um, value add execution and a sale immediately thereafter. So if you might, you know, you might think about this fund having a portfolio construction where let's say a third of the assets are um, value add um, acquisitions of office space where we're, you know, improving that asset, uh, leasing it up, you know, adding additional uh, NOI to the property and then, you know, returning that property to the market to maybe a core buyer or if it's a smaller asset to a 1031 type buyer. Um, so we're not holding those uh, those investments long term because really office has sort of lumpy um, cash flow because of the elongated lease time periods and the exaggerated TI and leasing costs that are associated with those um, those investments. Um, so that's that tends to be our approach on on office. And so at, at any given time, we're not, you know, planning to hold for elongated periods of time office in the portfolio. Multifamily, on the other hand, we are in the midst of a uh, 10 to 12 year continuing trend where demand is uh, continues to outstrip supply, in particular in the segment that we're focusing on, which is the uh, affordable renter or the workforce housing renter, where virtually there just isn't enough new supply um, in good locations for that, that renter profile. A as a result, um, you know, we're willing to hold that uh, type of asset a little bit longer. Number one, if we're building it scra uh, from scratch, it, it takes us at least three years to get a property like that uh, stabilized from, from ground up. And typically we would want to season that investment for a couple of years. Usually we will find that our um, rental rate, our, our uh, growth rate, and income will will um, exceed our our pro forma in the three and a half to four percent range, um, and so that gives us an opportunity to um, really create a lot of additional value by holding those a little bit longer in the portfolio life. And what's the breakout breakdown between office and retail? I mean, office and multifamily within past funds, and what's the expectations within this fund, and also the breakdown between ground up and value add within the multifamily. So I think um, it, we would, you know, if you looked at our portfolio today, we're about 6,000 or so apartment units and roughly 2 million square feet of, of office under management. You know, if you, you approximated that in total square footage, that's about 50-50. I think ultimately our portfolio here would, would, would probably be in that range, maybe, maybe slightly balanced more to, um, to office. Uh, you know, we would expect that some of the office acquisitions that we acquire here for one reason or other, we won't be able to execute on the, on the entitlements. And, and that's perfectly fine. We're happy to hit a single and a double on those types of, of projects only and not, not achieve the entitlements. Um, you know, but at any given time, you know, we would think that that portfolio construction would be about 50, 50. And then uh, ground up versus value added multifamily. Um, you know, we think uh, most of the multifamily activity uh, will be ground up um, in this particular case, but that's not to rule out the fact that I think we will occasionally come across 
some opportunities to acquire uh, maybe some distressed multifamily development that fits our link profile. And that's what, you know, we will be occasionally looking for that. Um, our presentation uh, does include, as I mentioned earlier, um, a case study for a, a project um, very similar to that, where we acquired a 268-unit um, apartment community in the Charleston uh, metropolitan area that was distressed. Uh, it had a construction defect that we figured out um, how to fix, um, and uh, uh, we bought the property um, for $5.8 million. We're putting about $19 million in new capital to fix the problem, and at the end of the day, we'll have about $35 million in a project that will have over 48 to maybe even $50 million of, of value. Uh, in addition to that, we actually had excess land that came with that site, so that's similar to our strategy, which we did not underwrite the value for, and we just achieved additional upside entitlements for that, allowing us to add additional 90 units. So that's a that's an example of I think some uh, uh, opportunities we will see um, perhaps in the you know in the acquisition uh, process to acquire multifamily. But I think those will be except exceptions rather than um, kind of the standard, I think the standard will be executing on, on vertical development, but I would not rule out acquiring one or two um, uh, multifamily properties through that. All right. And has Grub Properties ever lost investor uh, equity? Uh, we, uh, we have had two properties um, in our history that would um, be that would qualify in that category. The first is um, a property, a condominium development that we did in um, 2001. We opened uh, the condominium sales for that project the day um, that 9-11 occurred. And so um, to give you an idea how we responded to that with investors in that project, uh, we turned around and actually wrote investors uh, their equity checks back and said, we'll take on this risk burden going forward. So that's that in that particular case, um, although uh, investors um, you know, w would have, in theory, lost um, uh, equity dollars, we, we actually made them whole in that particular case. As it turns out, that, that investment barely did break uh, even, but um, but we felt it was important to provide that capital back to investors at that point in time because of that exogenous event. Um, the second one I, I would mention is um, uh, the Invesco portfolio. Uh, so we we had a, a large transaction with Invesco Realty Advisors, where, De De where Delta's pilot pension fund, Stanford University, brought in a capital to buy out $200 million of legacy assets or just under $200 million of legacy assets from our portfolio back in 1999. In 2001, uh, Stanford, who was the majority investor in, the, in that joint venture, got caught in the tech bust. And so they elected to liquidate a wide spectrum of portfolios across the United States. We were one of the more liquid portfolios at the time here in North Carolina. And so they elected to do that. Um, and that, that particular um, uh, transaction, I think, is in our track record. Um, and that, uh, that resulted in um, a loss of, of equity capital at their decision. Um, and in fact, we, uh, we recommended highly against it. Um, and so when it came time to sell it, we actually bought about 50% of that portfolio back from our partner because we felt so strongly the real estate had additional value left to go and it and it certainly proved that proved that to be the case All right. so those are two examples and not too bad for investors uh a lot of our well, guys invest with our money. Find out. so i was going to say too uh, we've never had a deed in lieu in our in the history of the company we've never had a foreclosure never had a remote bankruptcy um it, during the uh last economic recession um, we stopped all new investments in 2005, and between 2005 and 2008, we went from 38 individual investments down to five, um, and that is primarily, you know, why we um, 
uh, we were able to grow so aggressively out of the downturn is we just did not have the legacy issues and balance sheet issues that many of our peers did in 2008, 2009. So coming out of 2010, we were able to grow um, and we had a you know, perfect lender track record, uh, which is really important in this industry, as you can imagine. And what's your take on the market today versus how it was in 2007-8? Do you see any similarities or we still got some room to grow? Yeah, I think it's very different. You know, in 2008, um, you know, we had some very marked uh, supply issues in the, uh, you know, in primarily in the for sale housing industry, both single family and uh, uh, high density condo. Uh, that oversupply, which was obviously um, really a financing availability of capital and financing issue. Uh, that exacerbated that, um, and so I won't try to go into the details of that. We don't see that supply issue as a as really the the, the conditions today. In fact, in the segment of office investing and apartment investing that we're operating in, we see an undersupply um, and, and really a um, you know virtually I won't call it an endless demand, but we see a a significant demand that I think is going to be very hard to secure. We, we think, in fact, that the United States is in the middle of perhaps one of the greatest housing crises um, that we'll see, uh, certainly in our generation, um, or that we haven't seen since the 1970s, since the boomers. And, um, and that, we think, will be continued, that we think um, uh, will continue to be exacerbated by um, the rising construction cost. In fact, I was just looking at the Turner Construction Cost Index and last year we exceeded 5% uh, rise in, in construction cost. And that's gonna make um, providing relative affordability uh, very difficult in new construction in both the for sale segment and in the, um, in the rental segment, you know, which is primarily why we're focused on trying to figure out a way to get there, because I think then you, 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 you have virtually almost an endless demand. All right. A lot of our guys use uh, 401k money and IRA money to invest. Are you aware of any UBTI issues or other issues that would preclude them from investing with those type of funds? Uh, there, uh, there may be some UBTI income, so I, I would not want to uh, represent that there is not UBTI income. Um, it's not significant. Uh, and so, that, but that is one thing to be aware of. Typically, and I'm not a tax expert, so I won't uh, profess to be one on the call here, um, but typically that's only um, an issue for qualified plans, if I recall. Uh, but again, I'm not an expert in that regard. Um, we do allow for, um, uh, we do have several IRA investors. In fact, I, I have uh, investments in several of our pre previous funds through my IRA. IRA. Uh, uh, so I'm familiar with the fact that we do allow for that. Yeah, it is a little tricky. The yeah, significant is, is it is a little. Oh, sorry, go right ahead. No, I just said you said significant. Is it you know two two percent, ten percent of, of the the income might be UBTI or what? What? It's pro probably less than three percent. Right. Okay. And I'm sorry. Go ahead with what you were saying. Oh, I was just going to say, um, you know, it's, it is a little bit tricky because there are certain administrators that won't accept it. Um, you know, there are our head of investor relations can certainly make any recommendations to um, uh, administrators that uh, that are easy to work with, if, if that's helpful. All right, very good. And then uh, back to the original questions. Are there any current deals in the portfolio that are under underperforming, or are there any current deals that are overperforming? In our overall uh, Grub Properties portfolio? No, I was thinking of this fund in particular. Oh, in this fund, we know um, all of these are early investments. So currently, uh, the only one that's truly under construction right now is Link Apartments Innovation Quarter. Uh, that's a project in, in Winston-Salem I mentioned earlier. Um, that project is currently about 30 days behind schedule on construction, primarily weather-related, uh, not too unusual, um, although we are um, currently below uh, 
uh, you know, uh, well inside of our, our cost and, and potentially could have some savings in that project. So, um, you know, I think that's uh, probably about par for the course um, in, in construction given labor supply right now. So we feel like that's, you know, on, on par to be, um, you know, hitting our, our performer projections. Um, you know, we may very well be able to make up those 30 days with, uh, with better weather conditions here in the summer. The, the spring tends to be a little bit of a, more of a rainy season for us. Um, the other two, two investments that we've closed on are uh, projects where we are in, in the design phase on right now and securing construction financing. Those are all on schedule. We anticipate to secure construction financing late this summer, early um, fall for the Grant Park project I mentioned earlier. And then the uh, Fourth Street project will be one that we would secure, uh, finish our design work on and secure financing for in um, late fourth quarter. Right now, we, it looks like we're on track to close before the end of this month, uh, perhaps the first week of um, May. Uh, the transaction I mentioned in um, Fairfax, Virginia, in the D.C. metropolitan area, and that's a you know, roughly a 275,000 square foot office investment. Um, there's a strong chance we actually could be uh, ahead of Performa right out of the gate. We're in pro uh, knock on wood here. Uh, we're in negotiation with a tenant that would take a full floor, um, and uh, we're hopeful we'll actually uh, potentially get that inked in the first several weeks um, after closing that transaction or potentially even before, which would be um, you know, a real home, home run for us on that uh, transaction uh, right out of the gate. And the pipeline, is it uh, pretty full? Is it still pretty easy to find deals? What, what do you see in the next uh, six, 12 months? Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, we're typically reviewing about four to five deals a week at, th at this current pace. Um, you know, I think our team's pretty optimistic. We actually just onboarded um, yesterday another um, uh, a person to assist in our um, acquisition team. So we'll have some additional help there to keep that pipeline activity going. We've identified uh, two additional markets, um, Houston and Northern Virginia, obviously Northern Virginia being um, one we're going to get ready to close a deal on, uh, where we're going to spend some additional time. Uh, we think the opportunities are pretty unique in Houston right now. And uh, some of the Northern, Northern Virginia submarkets around DC uh, hold some real opportunities, um, as, as is the case with our Argonne Plaza transaction. So, um, so yes, I think we're, we're, we're still seeing good opportunity. Um, I think the Southeast is pretty unique for this strategy. And you'll stay in the Southeast for this fund exclusively? Uh, yeah, uh, the Southeast and out to uh, as far West as Texas, but uh, primarily be isolated to um, maybe the Houston markets, and potentially the Dallas and you know, Austin markets at, at most. Is that similar to the other funds? Have, is, have they always been pretty much uh, the is, southeast? Except the, uh, yeah, the Texas and uh, Northern Virginia markets are, would be new. Um, but other than that, um, you know, our markets in uh, you know Georgia, Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, um, uh, you know, up through Richmond um, and Tennessee. For all markets that we've been in and other funds in no, Alabama, I'm sorry. All right. And how much, uh, I guess, skin in the game, how much is the uh, group putting into this fund as a percentage of the fund or t total dollars? Um, well, we're, uh, we're, re uh, we're required to invest a minimum of three and a half million. I, I would suspect that that dollar amount will be north of that because we, uh, that's three and a half million that will be, directly investing as the manager, which uh, we've got about 25 employee owners that are owners in the manager um, that uh, that will be investing that capital. But we've we've got several other employees that will also uh, ultimately do direct investments. And that's over and above any acquisition fees or fees that are built in. That's actual. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I, I think it's important to um, say that we, we do not charge any acquisition fees. For disposition fees, um, and so the the the, uh, the fees that are charged at the fund are, are solely the acquisition. I'm sorry, the um, asset management fee. Um, you know, on the services side, we do provide services to the various properties, including property management, uh, development and construction management, um, 
services, uh, and so those those of course are are at market uh, market rate fees. So did you go over the the fees at the end of your presentation? I, I missed that. I, I did not, but I'm happy to do that. So um, with that, I'll just summarize that real quickly. You know, our target here is to you know raise a couple hundred million. We're, we're primarily doing that initially with um, you know individual investors, family offices, you know. Um, and, uh, and high net worth uh, uh, families um, initially. And then, you know, we've uh, already begun um, our next leg, which is to begin to work with endowments and pension funds and investment com insurance companies and, and such that invest in funds as well. We anticipate that um, that effort will ramp up. We just brought um, on a, a gentleman by the name of Jet Taylor, who's assisting us in, in uh, in accessing uh, those groups, we we think that you know those, those that capital is typically a larger chunks and uh, and and typically callable, um, and so we envision that that we'll continue to fundraise to the balance at least to the balance of this year and, and potentially through uh, the first or second quarter of next year, um, uh, uh, and that'll be our our, our target raise. Uh, we have an eight percent preferred return um, that would be. Um, Accrued and compounded uh, to investors um, until we, you know, start paying uh, out out distributions, which we uh, anticipate would start occurring after the conclusion of the investment period. Um, our target return to investors is sort of a mid-teens um, IRR and hopefully a 2x multiple. Um, uh, the waterfall then would be, you know, an 8% preferred return, return of capital. Uh, the manager would get caught up on its, you know, pro rata share of the uh, accrued, accrued portion of the uh, carried interest for that 8% uh, pref, and then uh, all capital would be uh, split 82% to members and 18% to the member thereafter. Um, we're charging a, an asset management fee of 1.8% um, on committed and unreturned capital um, after the investment period that will be um, on actual invested capital. Um, actually invested in unreturned capital at that point. And so, you know, as capital's return, that P obviously uh, goes down. And what is your expectation of the capital call schedule? So the fund will stop fundraising second quarter 2019 and then quarterly calls, semi-annually calls, and, and what do you think would be 100% calls? Yeah, so I, I think um, initially – uh, for this next closing here in, um, or really this week, um, uh, we anticipate uh, closing, I mean, calling 25% of the capital. We do have a little bit of a unique uh, program for this last, for this uh, closing for our existing investor pool and, and any investors that come in this week, uh, where we're allowing them to effectively prepay their capital. And, um, and in return, we will um, structure the 75% uncalled capital as a member loan and pay a current 8% interest on that member loan to uh, to those investors that want to take an op take that opportunity. That that allows us then to continue our, our fundraising. Um, you know, it's, you know, still close our existing four deals here uh, with capital from you know uh, those uh, those early stage investors, and then rewards them with a little bit of uh, additional return on idle capital if they have it uh, available at this point. And what is the, how many capital calls do you anticipate? How many have you done in past funds? Is it every quarter, every, how, how often? You know, and, and when do you think it will be done? Yeah, generally, it's hard to say, but, you know, because it, it really uh, comes with, you know, when the opportunities come. So, you know, we, we uh, um, uh, but generally I'd say, you know, once a quarter um, to as infrequent as, um, you know, every other quarter. And those are typically in 10 to maybe uh, 10 to 20% increments. So, if, you know, we went, you know, I think our first call here was 10%. Uh, we added 15% for this call. We've had, you know, uh, two quarters between our, our last adjustment of that amount. And how many years or months after the fundraising period ends can you call capital? Um, so, uh, we would need to call it all, uh, through the investment period, which uh, is May of 2022. 
May of 22. And but you'll close the fund second quarter. Tw I, I'm sorry. I, did I, I I meant May of 2020. I think I might have misspoken and said 2022. So May of 2020. But you think that the fund will stop accepting new investors second quarter of 19, correct? And then there'll be another year that you'd still raise mon money from within the, the investors. That, that's correct. And so likely this this first this year, uh, this next year between now and say this time next year, in an ideal sense, we probably would not call much additional capital, um, primarily because you know ideally we're raising all additional needs through additional investors. And then starting thereafter, we would have additional calls as we secure new properties. Would you ever see having to give back capital because you raised too much in the interim? I've had a fund do that. Uh, no, I don't think there's, you know, I think our our pipeline is robust enough. That we don't anticipate that. I wouldn't rule it out, of course. We've never had to do that. Um, but uh, uh, But I don't anticipate that. All right. And then the last question, do all investors have the same terms? Um, uh, all investors have the same terms until you get to a, a total invested capital breakpoint of $5 million, in which case we'll discount the asset management fee to 1.5%. And then we have a breakpoint at $10 million, where we'll discount the asset management fee to 1.25%. Currently, we only have one investor that uh, is has broken the five million dollar mark, so I, I believe we only have one investor that meets that qualification right now. Would you ever consider a group total as a single investor to get that? Maybe for a discussion would, down the road. But we'd be open to discussing that. Yep. All right, very good. All right. Well. I think that's all the questions we had, and we're at the end of our hour anyway. So I do thank you very much for uh, taking the time for the call. Sorry for the technical difficulties, but I think I got most of it recorded, and I'm sure we'll probably have some follow-up questions in the days and weeks to follow. But as far as getting the 8% uh, loan, or whatever exactly you called it, when does that? When do the investors have to have their paperwork in if they want to take advantage of that? Um, they'd have to have it in by Friday to take advantage of that. Um, and again, that doesn't curtail having them come in as investors. It just uh, that's kind of the threshold um, date for taking advantage of the member loan. All right, very good. Well, I'll let you guys go, and we'll have a short discussion among ourselves. But thank you very much for your time, and I really appreciate it. Terrific. Well, thank you, Mark, and and thank you to everybody participating on the call. We appreciate again your interest in in uh, investing with us, and look forward to getting to know you as investors if you choose to do so. Very good, Todd. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. Now we're starting our new policy of discussing the webinar after the sponsor leaves. So if you're muted, please unmute yourself. And uh, I'll try to unmute people as well and get people's feedback on what they thought of our call. Um, I missed about 15 minutes in the middle of it, but uh, I think I caught most of it. Anybody have any uh, thoughts on the Grub webinar? The silence is deafening. Oh. Anyone have anything they want to add? Questions about the webinar? Uh, Mark, it's Les Edelman. I'd sent you a, a private message, but I didn't know if they'd already covered it. Unfortunately, I came in, I think, at least half an hour late to the call um, about um, geographic differences in this fund versus uh, their prior couple of funds uh, yeah, already I, doing something. I quickly, I kind of went over that at the end uh, with them. Yeah, you were yeah, you're kind of going in that direction. <laughs> yeah, I, kind of, I thought I kind of covered it without asking specifically, but... They're always been in the southeast, and they've never done anything but the southeast. But they may go to Houston and Texas uh, this year with this fund. So the only difference would be they'd go slightly more west, southwest. Uh -huh. so they're, uh, uh, what did what did they say about leverage? Uh, their average uh, leverage to value is 57% uh, across all funds. 
So they're uh, on the low end, and I think he said 35% of the assets are still marked at cost. So I guess some of that, some other assets have marked to market to come up with that value. So I, uh, I suspect it's probably in the 65% range uh, as far as cost, and then 57% value. Mm-hmm. And the uh, I don't know if everybody understood, but if you invest this week, you pretty much can invest your entire entire capital amount, and you get your eight percent prep. They're calling it a loan, but essentially uh, they're they're paying you interest for the entire uh, amount because they're only calling twenty five percent now. So if you put in a uh, hundred thousand dollar commitment, you could put the entire hundred thousand in now. 25,000 would be quote invested. The other 75% would be earning 8% interest, or you know, if you were invested, 8% preferred. So it's pretty much the same as uh, investing Mark, 100% capital. Yes, Mark. Do you think that that part that they're calling like a loan? Do you think it has different capital stack rights than than others? Like, uh, do do you have? I mean, if they run into problems, do the do the quote lenders have uh, some kind of higher priority than the than the have equity to, investors? Would have to look at the docs. I mean, the way they the way he yeah. described it, it, was in the was a, it was a loan, and a loan would say higher pr- priority than equity. So we'd probably in between yeah. the two. But I, I have no idea. What it would it would probably be subordinated to their lenders, so it would probably be somewhere in the middle. Yep, that'd be my guess. Uh huh. Okay. And yeah, it's uh, interesting. So similar to. Uh, MLG, it's going to be open for another year, and similar to MLG, if we raise uh, apparently five or ten million dollars, we can get. Uh, we haven't. I briefly negotiated right there, but uh, it sounds like they're open to negotiating on that. So I think if, a, if our group comes in between five and ten million dollars, we can get the one point five percent management fee, and then whatever the ten million dollar one was, and uh, they're already at an eighty two eighteen split, which is better than most. So. Uh, that could be pretty advantageous, and I personally have wanted to like to wait when you can and see how the economy performs and how the assets perform. Uh-huh. So this would be one that I would probably not invest until second quarter of 19, but uh, I think we can have a long Well, that 8% with- on, the, uh, on that loan piece, that sounds pretty good because, I mean, there are a lot of uh, platforms where you can do short-term, like whether you give a hard money loan or – Alpha flow, for example, and even that, you know, it usually takes a year to get your money back. You're not getting more than than eight percent. So, eight eight <laughs> percent sounds pretty good. If I agree, if I mean that's the trade off. I mean that's MLG. You yeah. don't have that option, so it, it's it's a pretty much no brainer. This adds a little complexity to it that you you may want to invest now because of the eight percent. So it's not as black and white as MLG was to me. So it depends on how much <laughs> capital you have sitting around it. What your particular cash flow is, but if you got a lot of money sitting yeah. around and uh, you believe in their story, you know why not invest now? Anybody else have any comments, questions? All right. Well, I guess we'll call it a day. I'll, I'll ask you. More, I'll ask you one more question, Mark. I can't believe nobody else is dying. There have to be other. people people listening in um sort of in in the universe of of the the funds you've looked at which are you know multi-asset funds like this one uh gut feeling uh as far as the quality of the management do you feel like this comes in say you know top quartile second third fourth quartile like you know what's your gut feeling about the quality and where where it fits in and the the stack of firms that you've analyzed uh i think it's in at least the probably top quarter they uh they've been around for like he said, 40 years and uh, never really lost investor money. The one time they could have, they, they stepped to the plate and uh, made investors whole, except for the insurance company, which I think is an outlier, which really wouldn't affect us. And uh, they've got a pretty unique, different model uh, as far as this link model and, and trying to go after the, the empty parking spot. So I, uh, it's not just the average run of the mill sponsor. I think they've, uh, and of course, the southeast. I'm a little biased since I live here, and, but uh-huh. it is. they're Charlotte based. Yeah, they're Charlotte, and I'm in, in Salisbury, which is 25 miles north of Charlotte. So, uh-huh. all right. In, and I've got a uh, <clears throat> couple of members that are in our group that I know personally. I've invested with them uh, for years and, and one-off projects, and uh, and put a lot of money with them 
and I've been very, very pleased. That's how I found them actually. And uh, so, is there uh, is there a deck available? Uh, what what's available to us right now? Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, there is a presentation deck that similar to what he went over in the uh, grub thread, and then there's all oh, I think they had some quarterly updates that they put in there as well. But it, in uh, the, okay, in the grub, I'll look in the forum. In the grub forum. Uh -huh. And then, yeah, uh, hey Mark, is there any penalty if you want to wait up to the second quarter of two, next year? Uh, there is and there isn't. You have to pay yourself your 8% PREF that's been approved. Because everybody, it's like another fund. I can't remember which one. Uh, Origin, I think. You, Everyone is treated as if they invested day one. So everyone's accruing as of, I guess, the first of middle of 17 so you're you have to pay the, the 1.5 to 1.8 percent fees that they pay plus you have to pay the accrued referred returns that you will get back eventually anyway so you're kind of prepaying yourself so in the end the only penalty is you, you're paying the uh one point that asset management fee that the guys that ran originally have to pay but if you join day one you'd pay them anyway and you may get to bail and not invest if things go south so it's it's pretty much a wash in my mind. Mark, who do we reach out to if we wanted to pursue it? Uh, either Christy Burns, which was on the uh, webinar, but I don't think she spoke, or Todd Williams. And I think that uh, he mentioned they have a, a fundraising guy, Zeb or Zach. Uh, but I can – I'll put all that up. I'll probably, if, if there is much uh, – interest from the group will probably start its own page and get a liaison for the group and uh, negotiate exactly if we can invest the five or ten million dollars so I uh, reach out to me and I'll send you the email address but I think I put Todd's email address in that uh, thread at uh, Google groups but I'm not 100 percent sure so they are anticipating that 50 percent of the fund would be office properties and 15 the multi-family that's, that's been their averages over time, and they, and they anticipate that again. But they, they say that they, they don't hold office as long as they do the uh, uh, multifamily. That they're more in value-add, get it up to Class A and then sell it. That's kind of their model. And all of the multifamily is going to be development, ground up? Uh, I think the majority. There is – they do some uh, – he gave one example of a value add, but I think uh, the, most of them are going to be ground up, and a lot of them will be this link stuff where they turn the parking lot into a big office into a, a shared parking lot with a deck, and then they build multifamily on some of that land to get the land cheaper. Yeah, that seems like a great concept, really. Yep, yeah, I mean, it's pretty unique. I've never heard of it, and uh, I don't know anybody else that does it. If, if it works, I suspect others will, but... It uh, it makes sense. It's logical. It's a way to save money, which adds value, which gives higher returns. So I'm on. Board. Mm -hmm. uh, these members who have invested with them from before, um, yes. is there a possibility to be able to talk to them? Uh, yeah. I uh, well, I know one of them is pretty active. One of them uh, is a member, kind of name only, and just kind of uh, follows and doesn't. He's he's more of a hands off guy. With pretty deep pockets, but uh, I'm sure the uh, other gentleman I'll talk to and, and, and see if he'll share his thoughts. But I can't speak for him, but I'm pretty sure he will. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? All right. Well, I thought it was uh, productive. I will uh, record it. And I guess I'll have to put up two webinars because when I my IT guy for some reason rebooted our system and I was out for 15 minutes so the end of his presentation won't be there but the first part of his presentation will be on one uh, webinar and then the Q&A part will be on a second webinar and I'll, I'll put those up and put it at the uh, Grub uh, thread at uh, Google Groups and then I will uh, see if we can find a volunteer to be the liaison because I think this could be a, something very similar to MLG a long term uh, Fund that we potentially raise a lot of money on. Yeah, All but right. MLG does not do MLG does not do any development. MLG does not do development. No, I meant similar as in it's a fund that's open for uh, over a year. 
that we hit reach a five million dollar goal, we got a break, and I think we can do a similar, uh, not not exact the same terms, but a, a better break if we invest five or ten million dollars as a group. I, mean, I have to do more negotiation, but he sounded like he went into that at the end of the call. Also, with diamonds, the big difference is all of your money can go in at one time. Yes. Whenever that call comes, you can put all your money. Don't have to wait up to the end of investment period. Yeah, and you can with these guys if you do it this week. So there's not much time on that. And you know, a lot more due diligence has to be done. But they're offering that one-time opportunity, you know, if you, if you heard the end of that. But you get the 8% return on the other 75% if you invest uh, by Friday, I guess. All right. Thank you, guys. We'll chat next time. Yeah. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.